All right, so what we've got here is we're going to start off by talking about the unit circle. Okay. Oh, that's highlighter. Okay. Uh, unit circle, everybody's favorite thing, right? And so if I go and I draw a nice unit circle, look at that freehand perfection right there. Uh, and then I know it's impressive. Uh, so we have this unit circle like that. And what we can do is base this off of the metric, we can call it is x squared plus y squared equals one. Essentially what this tells us is that every value of x squared and y squared we put together have to be squared and add up to one. So they are all a distance. Every point that we would come up with that would fit in that equation is all equidistance from the origin. They're all one away from the origin, right? So that's the equation of a circle. And so that's what we end up with, a circle with a radius of one. If we go in and we look at a specific point on the circle, just anywhere we pick, uh, what we can do is we can refer to the X component of this. If we come out on the X axis, right? We can say that this is the cosine and we're gonna call it T, the cosine of T. And then we can come over here vertically and come across and take that component of it. And it will be, we'll call it sine of T. Now, if we look at the area that is actually swept out in here, this area of the pi right there, uh, that little part area swept out by our radius as we moved around to that point, it turns out that that area, that area in there is equal to T divided by two. All right, so in other words, what we're saying is that T is twice the area swept out by the radius. Okay, so T is twice the area swept out by the radius. And in other words, we're saying here, essentially, we can just make like a little note here, note, T is just theta. Okay, T is, it's just theta. Right, so uh, that's how it relates to whatever that area is. Okay, now, if uh, we look at this, we can say then that A equals T over two pi times pi R squared. So in other words, it's a fraction of the entire area there, right? T is some fraction of two pi, and then we're taking that fraction of the entire area of the circle, pi r squared, right? Does that make sense? So if T was a quarter of a quarter of a way around, then that fraction out in front would be uh, one fourth, and we'd have one fourth the area of the whole circle, right? If T put us like up here, we'd have one fourth the area of the circle, right? Because what is that angle? In radians. It's pi over two over two pi, right? So we should get one fourth there and we'd have one fourth the total area. So this should make sense then. If we do that, we can look here, we can, in, in what we've done here, we can cancel out some stuff here and we get, uh, what did I do there? We end up getting, oh my gosh, I think I accidentally deleted something from my notes before I printed them. Gosh, R equals one. So 
I didn't put this in there. This just becomes a one. So we have t over two pi times pi. The pi's will then cancel. And we have a equals t over two, which is what I was just saying to you right up above there, which also you could think of it as equals theta over two. So that just tells us that t equals two a, which we knew because I told you that right up there in the beginning, but now I'm actually showing it to you. Okay, anybody ever thought of the unit circle this way before? All right, now, we can actually take this another step further. This is a, an equation I think I kind of brought up to you before and some of you probably know it. And that is e to the i t equals cosine t plus i sine of t. All right. And what this does for us is we can look at two parts of this. We can look at the real part and we can look at the imaginary part. Right? The real part of e to the i t or e to the i theta, if you want, is the cosine function or cosine operator on theta. And the imaginary part is your sine. Okay? We can also do the complex conjugate of this, e to the negative i t is going to equal cosine of t minus i sine t. So that's a nice little complex conjugate. You just make all your i's into negative i's. All right, and these are two uh, pretty important things. We can combine these together I think I showed you all that on the board before um, and actually multiply them together. So you get e to the i t times e to the negative i t. That's going to give you one. And if you do cosine plus i sine t times cosine of t minus i sine t, all right, you get cosine t plus i sine t times cosine t minus i sine t. Uh, when you do this, maybe I should write this out for you. This is e to the i t times e to the negative i t. Uh, this will equal one. This becomes cosine times cosine. That's cosine squared t. Then we get cosine times negative i sine. So this is cosine. We have an i there. Cosine t sine t, and then we have a positive i sine t times cosine t, so plus i cosine t sine t. So those two are going to cancel out. And then we have the last part, which will be minus i squared sine t. And then what's i squared? negative one, negative one. So this becomes one equals cosine squared t, and then we have minus negative sine t, or sine squared t, sorry. Uh, and that will then become plus sine squared t. And so there's that basic trig identity right there. Cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, right? We all know that one. And there it is just coming from uh, essentially what is our definition of sine and cosine? We can define it as cosine of t equals e to the i t, and the, the real part of e to the i t is what we define as cosine and sine. You can even express uh, cosine and sine purely as exponentials. So if I take this and I, I look at this and I say, all right, well, I can solve this and say, uh, you know, e to the i t equals cosine t plus i sine t. And so uh, what I can do this is I can say, all right, well, that means cosine t equals e to the i t minus i sine t. 
from my complex conjugate when I have e to the negative i t equals cosine t minus i sine t, which means I get here negative i sine t equals e to the negative i t uh, minus cosine of t, right? And so I can take this right here and substitute it in right there and I get cosine of t equals e to the i t, and then minus sine of t, so it'll become just, uh, you know, plus e to the negative i t, and then minus cosine of t like that. So that gives me two cosine t equals e to the i t uh, plus e to the negative i t, which tells me cosine of t equals e to the i t plus e to the negative i t over two. And there you go. There is cosine expressed purely as exponentials right there. Have you ever seen that before? And so we can use that and say, this is, this is our definition of cosine. And you can try it. If you wanna plug in values for t there and then calculate what these other ones are, uh, especially if your calculator will do imaginary numbers for you, you can throw those in there and you'll get, you should, you'll get the same answers. Okay, uh, we can then take that and plug it back in to our first equation there to get rid of cosine. So we can come back up over here and we can then say, uh, after that we can say uh, e to the i t equals, and instead of cosine, I'm going to write e to the i t plus e to the negative i t over 2 plus i sine t. And so we can solve this for sine. So we get i sine t equals e to the i t, and I'm going to make this 2 e to the i t over 2, minus e to the i t plus e to the negative i t over two. And so I get i sine t equals, and I can combine these together. I have two e to the i t minus e to the i t. So that's just e to the i t and then minus, minus e to the negative i t over two. And so I can say i sine t equals e to the i t minus e to the negative i t over two but I can divide both sides by i, right? And so if I divide both sides by i, I get a little 2i right there. So I can make it over 2i, uh, but you could also sometimes see this where the i is in the numerator because just as a little aside, what is one over i equal? Nope, not just i. Well, let's think about this. This is one over i. We can do times i over i, right? Because i over i is one. And so we end up with i over i squared. What's i squared? Not one, negative one. So one over i is negative i. That's pretty neat, huh? It's, it's, uh, it's reciprocal is its negative value got some neat properties when you go into these imaginary things, okay? So sometimes you might see this with that negative i up in the numerator, okay? But that's probably pretty much good enough right there. We can define sine right like that, okay? So again, more than you knew about sines and cosines. Uh, the reason that this exponential works is because when you multiply um, when you multiply imaginary numbers together, what you actually get are rotations. And you can try it and see. So let me see here, where did I do that? So let's take a look here. Let's say we looked at something like, let me add another page here. If we look at something like uh, multiplying these complex numbers gives us rotations, uh, what I mean by this is, let's say we had something like 2 plus 3i times 4 plus 5i. So when I look at this and I graph both of these points, right, if I have 2 
do I want to go with two, one, two, three, four, five, you know, and so on. And then uh, we have four plus five i. That means we come out at we come out four, and then we go up five. One, two, three, four, five, like that. And so then we go up here to five. When we do this, this is the point uh, four plus five i. So this would be four down here and a five i up here. I might have to move this because I think I'm going to need more room. Okay. There's four plus five I, and it essentially makes us a nice right triangle, right? Where our vertical axis is our complex axis, and then the other horizontal axis is our real axis. So we have four in the real axis and five in the imaginary. So four plus five I like that. And then we can do the other one, two plus three I. So that one is going to look like a one, two, one, two, three, put us right there. And we'll have something like this, right? Two and three I. And what I can tell you is right now, if I were to multiply those together and actually do it, right? I'm gonna get something back up over here. I may not know the exact value off the top of my head, but it's gonna be over there. And this is how I know. If I take that green triangle and I rotate it, okay? I'm gonna rotate this green triangle until it lines up with that hypotenuse of the red triangle. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stretch and scale this out. I'm gonna stretch this side all the way up to here, set it right on there, and then redraw my two plus three I triangle, wherever it's going to take me up here when I, whatever it is, right? It's going to take me somewhere like this, take me somewhere over here, and it's going to put me somewhere. So just in my head, I can take that triangle, make it bigger, and rotate it out, and I know I'm going to be somewhere over in this quadrant up there, okay? Let's see if I'm actually right. Let's multiply this together. Two times four is eight. Uh, two times five I is ten I. 3i times 4i is 12i, and then 3i times 5i is 15i squared, which is minus 15. We all agree with that? And so 8 minus 15 is negative 7, and then plus a 22i. And look at right where that would put me. It puts me somewhere back over here at like negative 7, and then up at 22. Pretty close for just even my just quick freehand sketch, right? So when you multiply these things, it causes rotations or it causes spirals. It either causes stuff to start from a point and spiral outwards if you keep multiplying it. So if we were to keep multiplying the our four plus five, and we were to keep multiplying it by two plus three, it would cause us to start spiraling around. We'd take that two plus three i, we would take that same triangle, we would stretch it out right here along the result, and it would take us like, it would take us way over here, right? We'd scale it up and it, we'd be over here. And then if we did it again, it would put us way down there and it would just keep going and spiraling us around as we keep adding on those triangles like that. So it can spiral us outward, it can spiral inward, like you can start somewhere hot and it spirals inward, or, there's one special case where it doesn't spiral and it just takes you around a circle. Any guesses? Any guesses? E to the IT. If you keep changing that T and keep multiplying those together larger, all it does is takes you around the unit circle. It doesn't spiral you out, it doesn't spiral in, it just goes around itself. So in fact, e, multiplying by e to the it just causes things to just rotate by whatever angle t you put in there. All right, it's a pretty neat little function there. You can just cause things to rotate by that angle. All right, if you don't believe me, play around with it some, try it and see. Uh, 
it actually does it actually does do that and so it's it's a very helpful thing in fact you ever seen those little things when you're listening to like a, a stereo or a speaker and you put it on there and it bounces up and down the different columns based on like like over here are the low ones and they'll get high when there's low sounds and these other ones bounce up real high when there's high sounds and the mid sounds and stuff that is actually what is called a Fourier transformation. This is just a little side for you. And the way that is actually derived by this guy, it's so absolutely brilliant, is essentially what you have is a whole bunch of different waves, different sound waves, like the longer waves are the low sounds and the, the short waves are the high pitch sounds. And they're all mixed together and they give you some crazy wave pattern. And what this function does is it takes that thing right there and it goes through and it wraps it around a circle. And it looks to see if it lines up with itself. If it lines up with itself, it amplifies and you get like a spike. And it says, aha, that frequency is there. That lot that wraps around the circle perfectly. Then it takes a slightly different circle and it wraps it around that circle. Oh, no, nope, I didn't get any spikes there. So it doesn't line up. That frequency is not there that would course that wavelength that would correspond to how big of a circle I did there is not there. And then it does a little bigger one and it wraps it around it. Check it. And it does this by, and if you ever look it up in the Fourier transformation, this is in there. Because as you go through the different values, and it also includes an integral in it, but as it goes through the different values of t, it just essentially keeps trying to wrap it around different circle sizes to look for what wavelengths are actually there. And so it can go through and break that part and say, all right, well, I found it and I had a little bit of a spike at this wavelength. I had a very big spike at this wavelength. So there's a lot of that one. And it just goes through and picks out how much there is of each different wavelength. And then it just shows you how much there was on those. Okay. So it's actually a very useful function. So any questions on any of that? Spiraling out, spiraling in. No, and you can use, I think I told y'all that before, you can use that e to the i theta to essentially come up with, you know, whatever you want. I'm going to show you one more real quick here for any of the trig functions. I think I did one on the screen, but I have one written right here. So let's do, let's do e to the i, or e to the, sorry, e to the 2i t. That's got to equal e to the i t squared. Okay, so e to the two i t, like that, essentially e to the i times two t is gonna equal e to the i t squared. So that's cosine t plus i sine t squared, we agree? This thing squared is cosine squared t plus 2i sine t, right? Plus i squared sine squared t. Just, just foil that thing out, right? On the left-hand side, I have e to the i times 2t. So I can actually write that as just cosine of 2t plus i sine of 2t. We agree with that? Because whatever t is, I'm just doing two of it, right? I can say 2t equals, you know, 2t equals r, and then it'd be cosine of r plus i sine of r, but then r is 2t, so I just put the 2t back in, right? So we all agree with the steps I just did right there? Now, I'm going to say cosine of 2t plus i sine of 2t equals, and what I can do here is start combining stuff together. Well, i squared is negative 1, right? Negative 1. So I have cosine squared t minus sine squared t plus i times two sine t. We agree with that? And now if these things are gonna be equal, 
For example, if I have A plus BI equals C plus DI, what that immediately tells me is A must equal C and B must equal D, correct? We agree with that? All right, so what I can do here is say that cosine of 2t must equal cosine squared minus sine squared t. The real part has to equal the real part. And the imaginary part, sine of 2t, must equal 2 times the sine of t. Oh, I forgot something. This is 2 sine t cosine t times cosine of t. Sorry, I forgot the cosine, didn't I? No one spoke up on that one. Where were you all on that one when I foiled it and you all agreed with me? OK, so we can come down here and say cosine of 2t equals cosine squared t minus sine squared t. That's a trig identity. And we can also say sine of 2t equals 2 sine t cosine t. Y'all seen those trig identities before? And there they are, derived just from that. Pretty neat. can tell everybody's super impressed. Try to maintain your excitement. Stay in your seats, please. Keep it calm. Be cool. Be cool. All right. Now that we are all absolute professionals on the unit circle and sines and cosines, and of course you can define any things like tangents and cotangents and, and you know, all those things are just, you know, combinations of the sine and cosine, right? Arc sine uh, and things, not arc sine, uh, uh, secant and cosecant. The, the, the arc sine and arc cosine, stuff, they're just inverses of these, just invert them. Um, now that we've done that, let's look at something called the unit hyperbola. Now, with the unit circle, we looked at all the collection of points such that x squared plus y squared equaled 1. And that gave us a circle. We were always the exact same distance away. Here, what we're going to look at is x squared minus y squared is always equal to 1. All right? No matter where you went on the unit circle, those two values squared and added together for your coordinates always equaled one, right? Now that's what the final force. So now what we want to make is a hyperbola where that no matter where we are on the hyperbola, if we take the two coordinates, square them and find their difference, it's going to be one. And that's our unit hyperbola. So let's take a look here. Here, let's draw some nice axes. Okay, and this is going to go through the point uh, 1, 0, and it's going to go like this. And so what we're going to do is draw in these 45-degree angle dotted lines like that, and then our hyperbola is going to asymptote to those dotted lines as we go through like that. And that's going to do it over here too. And this is the point, this, this little point right here is the point one, zero, because one squared minus zero squared is one, right? And of course, negative one squared minus zero one is also one, right? So this point right there is negative one, zero. And so here's our unit hyperbola. 
if we were to go ahead and pick a point along this hyperbola, like say we picked this point right here, okay, what we can do is drop a line straight down to the x-axis and then this length right here will be what we call the hyperbolic cosine, which people often just call cosh or sometimes cosh of t. Boy, that's not a good spot to have drawn that, huh? Uh, C-O-S-H of t. It's the hyperbolic cosine. Kosh or kosh. I usually say kosh, but I hear other people call it kosh, like gosh. Most of, most of the people when I was at USF all called it kosh. Okay, that will be our hyperbolic cosine. If we come straight across over here to the y-axis, then uh, we'll have this little bit right here. This will be our hyperbolic sine, S-I-N-H of T, called cinch, like pinch, cinch and kosh or kosh. All right. And here, T is area swept out by, or I'm sorry, is twice the area, it's twice the area swept out by the radius. And this is the radius right here that points out to that. That's our radius right there. It points out to our point there. And essentially it sweeps out this area right in here, like that. Not a triangle. Notice it's curvy on that one side. And so this is A equals T over two. And it's, what is that word? Analogous to that unit circle. Of course our little T angle there is, if it was an actual angle we were looking at over to that point, would never get past 45 degrees or pi, you okay? Yeah. Or, okay, or pi over four. It would just keep approaching it forever. But so we use a different value, a different thing for T. It's not, uh, it's not really the angle there, okay? So, oh, this little dotted line right here is y equals x. And of course, this little dotted line over here is y equals negative x. And it approaches and asymptotes to those two points, but never quite gets there. One is for a ratio for a circle, and the other is for a ratio on the hyperbola. So they are, they're different. So like if I do the, so if I come back over here, the cosine here is essentially how far, I, how far out I am right here, correct? And the sine is how far up I am right here. And that keeps me on the unit circle, right? Whatever, whatever two corresponding values, if you do cosine of something and the sine of the same value, it's always gonna put me on that unit circle. I go that far out in cosine, I go whatever, you know, cosine of uh, 20 and sine of 20. And so whatever cosine of 20 gives me, I go that far out in the X direction. And then whatever sine of 20 gives me, I go that far in the Y direction. I'm gonna land on the unit circle every time, as long as I'm doing the sine and cosine of the same number, right? Always gonna land me there. If I'm doing the unit hyperbola, as long as I do the same value for T, it's always gonna land me on that hyperbola always going to land me on it. So the difference is there's really no limit in size. Like, like all the cosines have to be less than one, one or less, right? That's not happening here because we're doing the difference. So, I mean, I can be, you know, if, if this is my 
hyperbola continuing on out forever, right? Going, exploding way up there. I can be like way out here on sine They can They can have huge numbers, right? Much greater than one. In fact, except for at t equals zero, they're, they're greater than one. Uh, but uh, they always land you on that, that unit hyperbola. This is actually a very useful type of mathematics for something called, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I choked for Minkowski space, which is actually the, the mathematics used for space time for Albert Einstein's uh, relativity and special relativity. It has a hyperbolic symmetry to it. Uh, in fact, it had its metric is, is a hyperbolic thing, something called the space time interval. And it is, it is hyperbolic in nature, not, not the regular geometry y'all are used to where the way we measure distance is based on x squared plus y squared equaling something, the Pythagorean theorem. This is the x squared minus the y squared thing, it's really not x and y anymore. It's, it's like x minus ct. So it's like x squared minus c squared t squared, but it, it's a constant. It's like a, it's the metric. It's how you measure distances in that space when you have that, that four dimensional space time. So uh, this is actually very useful type stuff when you get to that kind of stuff, even in physics. So uh, down here, you guessed it, we can relate this to exponentials. So we can say e to the t equals cosh t plus cinch t. And we can say e, well, let me move that down a little bit e to the negative t is equal to cosh t minus cinch t. And what you can see about this is that, uh, you know, like when we had e to the i t, cosine was the real part, sine was the imaginary part. Turns out here, cosh is even, is the even part, and cinch, any guesses, is the odd part of the function. Do we remember what even and odd functions were? So even functions were f of negative x equals f of x. We have that symmetry across the y-axis. And then odd functions were f of negative x equals negative f of x. And it was the symmetry about the origin. So like if it was an even function and you had the point one, two on it, then you'd have the point negative one, two on it if it was even. If it was odd and you had the point one, two, then you'd also have the point negative one, negative two. They'd both be negative. Okay, but if you make the x negative and you get back the original same y value, then that's what even functions do. All right, if we take like we did uh, previously and we combine these two, you're welcome to go ahead and, and, and try it by multiplying them together. e to the t times e to the negative t, we end up with one. And then cosh t times cosh, cosh t is cosh squared t. Then you're gonna have the cosh cinch and the other cosh cinch cancel out because one of them's positive, one of them's negative. And then you have minus cinch squared t. So similar to our cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, which comes from our x squared plus y squared equals one. Here we're doing x squared minus y squared equals one, and that gives us cos squared minus cinch squared equals one. So another parallel between them, but also kind of a, you know, a different kind of from this, uh, I can also show you some quick little relationships here. Uh, cinch of t is also equal to negative i sine 
of I T. So this is how they are related to the sines and cosines. Okay. Not going to go through and try and derive these. Cos T equals cosine of I T. And then the hyperbolic tangent of T is negative I tan I T. And then you can, you can just keep going through those, mixing and combining them and stuff like that, right? Where if we're doing the hyperbolic tangent, it's just hyperbolic sine over hyperbolic cosine. And that gives you that right there, which is negative sine I T over cosine of I T, which is tangent of I T. And then we have that negative I still there. Okay. And you can go through and do, you know, whatever the hyperbolic secant, hyperbolic cosecant. Okay. Any questions on this idea right here? You like how I related it back to that unit circle? All right. Let me show you one more thing. We will get to these later. Ah, I need another page again. We'll get to these later, but I want to show it to you now. All right. Taylor series. This is the idea that we can express functions, really any function, out as an infinite power series, as an infinite series, a summation. Turns out that, and this is how this was done, it turns out e to the x, the series for it is one plus x plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial plus x to the fifth over five factorial, so on and so forth forever. And we will actually get to the point when we do Taylor series, I'll show you exactly how you come up with that. All right, you, you, you do it with derivatives and such, and it's a, it's a series. It actually turns out to be that when you do it. And it'll be great, because when we get to that part, we'll try it. You, you'll see, you'll expand it up, it'll be that. The hyperbolic cosine, the cosh of x, turns out to be one plus x squared over two factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial plus x to the sixth over six factorial, so on and so forth. The cinch turns out to be x plus x to the third over three factorial plus x to the fifth over five factorial plus x to the seventh over seven factorial, so on and so forth. And what do you notice about this? First thing, this is all even. Second thing, this is all odd, right? These are all even little, each term is even or each term is odd. And what else do we notice? We can do this, one, one, x squared over two, x squared over two, x to the fourth over four factorial, x to the fourth over four factorial. If I had drawn it, the next one would be x to the sixth over six factorial, right? Those are all the odd parts or the all the even parts of the Taylor series of e to the x. x, x, x to the third over three factorial, x to the third over three, x to the fifth over five factorial, x to the, those are all the odd ones. They match up. Okay, that's pretty neat, isn't it? And so therefore, the sum, if we add these two together, they equal e to the x. Okay, and then just, let me write this last one here for you. This is also true. Uh, e to the i x, if you do it, it's one plus i x minus x squared over two factorial minus i x cubed over three factorial. So it just alternates like that or double alternates like that. 
cosine of x when you do it is one minus x squared over two factorial uh, plus x to the fourth over four factorial, uh, so on and so forth like that. Sine of x is x minus x to the third over three factorial uh, plus x to the fifth over five factorial, so on and so forth. And notice they match up too, right? If we look at that, we say, all right, this, that, you know, that, that, this, this, that, that, and so on and so forth for the real and imaginary parts. Pretty neat. And I have one more minute here. I did have one more thing here. And that is, I was going to do e to the i pi over 6. And, well, I was going to multiply it. It's e to the i pi over 6 equals square root of 3 over 2 plus i over 2. And what I wanted to do was take e to the, what did I write there? 5, e to the i, 5 pi over 6, and multiply it by e to the i pi over 6, like this. And what this will equal is, and I want you all to try this, square root of 3 over 2 plus i over 2 uh, times negative square root of 3 over 2 plus i over 2. I want you to try multiplying those out. The e to the 5 pi over 6 times e to the pi over 6 is obviously obviously just going to be e to the i pi. And then I want you to multiply those, those other two, factor them together, and see where it puts you. And then take a look at what happened when we started with e to the pi over 6, and we multiply it by e to the 5 pi over 6, and see where it rotates you to. We're, we're rotating e to the pi over 6 by 5 pi over 6. We're going to rotate. Where do you think that's going to put us? Right there. It's going to rotate us 5 pi over 6. So try it and see. Try multiplying these together. This side will be e to the i pi. And when you multiply those two together, see if you end up getting negative 1. You'll, well, try it and see. Dot, dot, dot. You'll get negative 1 plus zero i. So it totally does rotate you there. Okay? All right, y'all. Uh, I'll stop there. Tomorrow we'll actually get into